for and notice with me first John chapter one, reading verses five through seven. I'm going to title this message Walking in the Light, reading from verses five through verse seven. Had a man in one of the other churches that I pastored, and every time he met someone, he always asked him, he said, How's your walk with the Lord today? And I like that. And we'll also be singing Heavenly Sunlight out of our hymn this morning, Walking in the Sunlight, All of My Journey. He is the light, and in Him is no darkness. And that's not altogether there. I just took some words out of it. Speaks of our walk toward heaven, our journey in this life. Notice with me as we read verses 5, verse 6, and verse 7 this morning to begin. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Father, we thank Thee this morning for the wonderful privilege You've given us to assemble together. Father, we, we ask this morning for Thy blessings to be upon the reading of Holy Scripture. And Father, we pray this morning, as we have many, many times, that You would speak to our hearts. Father, we pray that we'd be attentive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and to the guidance from Thy Word that you have for us here this morning. And we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What we want to consider this morning is what it means to walk in the light, for God is light. When we come to this passage, we find that in verses 1 through 4, We find here that the Apostle writes this letter to believing saints to encourage them in their fellowship of the Father and Son and also one another. And that their joy may be full, verse 4. We find that verse 4 is the key to the entire book, to the entire chapter and the book, the purpose of this book. Notice as we read verses 1 through 4. He said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. We find here that fullness of joy comes from our fellowship with the Father, the Son, and one another. Close relationships grow out of our love for God and one another. Now, when he says here in verse 4, and these things right when you that your joy may be full. Joy has to do with the gladness of heart. And it's an inward delight in our God, a pleasure one feels in the Lord Himself. It is a deep down sense of well being, calm, satisfaction, and contentment. Revelation 19, 6 and 7, it characterized by the heavenly host of heaven. We see them rejoicing in the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, the uh, Bible speaks of this unspeakable joy. In other words, it goes beyond full expression. Then in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13, exceeding joy, that is to pass beyond, to surpass or excel. As we come here to verse 5, he begins this verse and he says, This then is the message 
which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He said, this is the message. That is the revelation we just read in verses 1 through 4, that mankind can know God through Jesus Christ and have fellowship with him. I want you to notice that John, the apostle here, he begins everything with God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the sum and substance of the gospel of Christ, the four verses we just read. It is the doctrine of Christ. It is the message of the apostle to you and I here today. Now, what I want to do this morning, and you have your outline. First of all, I want to take verse 5. And I want you to notice that we have here that God is light. That God is light. The second thing is going to be in verse 6. And we're going to talk about unbelievers walk in darkness. And then in verse 7, we're going to talk about believers walk in light. So let's get into the message here. Notice as we come back to verse 5. In verse 5. He says here in verse 5, he said, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Notice with me in verse 5. He begins here in this passage saying that God is light. In other words, this is one of the attributes of God. And it speaks, when we talk about light, it basically speaks of purity, righteousness and holiness, goodness and truth. In other words, we'll find the word light used in a number of different ways. Verse 1, 2, and 3 speaks of life and illumination. Light is the opposite of darkness. We know what darkness is. Darkness in the Bible, when we see the subject of darkness, especially in speaking of spiritual terms, darkness is the exact opposite of light. It has to do with evil and falsehood, unrighteousness, sin, and wickedness. Let me give you an example of that. Notice in chapter 2, reading from verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness had blinded his eyes. So, clearly in this passage, we see that darkness represents that which is evil, that which is wicked, and falsehood. And we find that in John 12 and verse 31, that Satan is called the prince of darkness. Now I want you to think about this. In the book of Genesis in chapter 1, Long before, or days before, that the sun, moon, and star were created. The Bible tells us in verse 2 that the earth was out without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. We find that this light is not the sun, moon, and stars, but this light has to do with the glory of God. That is, God Himself. And when we read in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-6, through 6, we find there in that passage that He likens the gospel being preached and shining light into our hearts as the day of creation. In other words, when God spoke... The darkness was dispelled in Genesis chapter 1. And when the gospel is embraced and believed, we find that the darkness is expelled in the life of an individual. So he says here that God is light in our text in verse 5. God is light. In other words, God is the source of light and life. 
We also find, write down the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 3, that there was a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. This is not the sun, this is the light of God. That blinded Saul of Tarsus for three days, and of course brought him to salvation. God revealed himself that way to Saul of Tarsus. In Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5, and there's two other parallel passages, Mark and Luke, the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ, His glory, that light, that shining, was unveiled at that moment to His disciples. They saw the light. They saw His glory. And you and I can see the same glory and beauty in the Scripture, by the Holy Spirit, and in prayer. We also find that in, and I'll just read these to you. I want you to stay where you're at for right now. I want you to listen to a few verses on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of John, in chapter 1, I'll be, begin here. In John chapter 1, he said in verse 5, Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, now that light is Christ, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, talking about John now, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Again, we would see this in John chapter 8. I'm just giving you you a few verses. In John chapter 8, we read here in verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Again, in John chapter 9 and in verse 15. John chapter 9 and in verse 15, you can write that down. And also, in John chapter 12, verses 35, 36, and in verse 46. We also know that Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2, and also in verse 22 through 27, that Jesus Christ will be the light of the new Jerusalem. That's recorded for us again in Revelation 22 and verse 5. We know that in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, that Christ alone dwelleth in the light, in the sense that He's the only one that is in heaven with a resurrected body, that dwells in the presence of the Father. James 1.17, the Father of lights. So we see here in, the, in our text in verse 5 that John is declaring this message. And the first thing he says in verse 5, he says that God is light. In other words, this means that God is holy, that God is perfect, and that God is righteous, and in Him is no evil, in Him is no sin. Notice the latter part of this passage. Notice the latter part of this passage. And by the way, as we think about this, not only is God light, but His Word, His Spirit, the Son, is light. In Proverbs 6.23, His commandments are a lamp and a law uh, is, is light. In Psalms 119.130, His Word giveth light. In Revelation 1, verses 12 through 20, the seven churches of Asia, they were to be a light unto the world. They're referred to as candlesticks. In other words, they were like a lamp or a light. So, we're talking about light in opposition to darkness. What is darkness? Darkness is the opposite of light. It represents evil, falsehood, unrighteousness, sin, and wickedness. So the first thing that John declares here, 
to the readers is that God is light. Let's read verse 5 again and notice this. He says in verse 5, he said, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And again, there's many other passages that will bear this out. Now notice as we come to verse 6, we're working our way to verse 7, but I'm laying a foundation. The fact is that God is light and in Him is no darkness. In Him is no sin and no evil. Now let's come to our second point and I want you to notice that unbelievers walk in darkness. Why? Because they have no spiritual life in them. They do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. An unbeliever can read the Bible. They can quote Scripture. They might could even sit down and talk to you about the Bible. But they are in darkness. They have no life or light in them. Now notice as we read in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him. That fellowship is mentioned in verse 1, 2, and 3. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, that is with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Aren't you glad that God said this and we didn't have to say this? If we said this, people would get angry with us, wouldn't they? God said this in verse 6. He said, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, in other words, we walk in our sin and our rebellion, He's saying that we are liars. And He also says, and do not the truth. I want you to think about this. What we find here in the first part of this verse, if we say, that is, if we claim to know God. Get out and talk to people, especially down south here, that are living like the devil and say, do you know the Lord? Oh, yes, I know the Lord. Living like the devil. What he's saying in this passage, if we claim to have fellowship with God, which means to have something in common with God. And at the same time, we walk in darkness, we are liars. For God is light. In other words, God is good, God is truth, God is righteousness. And if we say that we're a Christian, and we know Him and we love Him, but our life is saying something else, God says, that we are liars. In other words, the argument here is from what is inconsistent. Saying one thing and doing another. To live a sinful life while professing Christ is to live a lie. Would you not agree? Now notice what he says. He said, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. Now we're going to get down in a few moments to what does it mean to walk in light. That's what we're after. But we're laying a foundation. We're trying to show what it is not. We see that God is light and in Him is no sin, no darkness. Now we're looking at the fact of those who do walk in darkness. What does this mean? Well, it means they're living in sin. They're living in error. They're living in contradiction to the truth. They're living in contradiction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice with me, hold on here and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Notice with me in Ephesians, hang on to First John, in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, what is this darkness? Walking in darkness, contrary to God. Living a life characterized by evil and unrighteousness. To be occupied with the things of this world. I'm going to give you some verses here, then I want to just refer to some others. 
In Ephesians chapter 2, the first few verses, he says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So we find here that unbelievers walk in darkness. They are not quickened by the Spirit of God. They walk according to the course of this world. We find that they walk in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh in mind in verse 3, and were by nature, this is what we were for, before converted, and were by birth, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. So we find here, in this passage, that all lost, they fit into the same category, they're walking in darkness. Notice with me in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 17. The Bible says in Titus 1.16, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Now that's referring to false teachers, but, but it can also apply to any lost person that's professing one thing and living another. Deuteronomy 28, verse 28 and 29 speaks of spiritual madness, as in Romans 1.28, those whom God has given over to a reprobate mind. You don't want a reprobate mind. It's a mind that can't think spiritually. It's a mind uh, that cannot uh, judge anything, biblically speaking. A reprobate mind. Notice in Ephesians 4, verse 17, we're talking about the lost. He said, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles, notice, in the vanity of their mind. Notice that. They live for themselves. They live as an animal. They only think about themselves. In verse 17, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That's the reason I gave you Deuteronomy. When God's curse is upon a nation, you see spiritual blindness. Well, those that are lost, they're spiritual blinded. Verse 19, who being past feeling, uh, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Turn back with me to our text in First John. So he says here in verse 6, if we say, think about that expression. In other words, if we make these claims. Again, in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Come down with me to chapter 2. In chapter 2, reading in verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So what we're looking at in this passage is someone who claims to know God, to love God, to have a relationship with God, and still yet their life is totally contrary to that. So the life does matter and gives evidence of where we stand with God. But he goes on to say in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. In other words, we walk in our sin and rebellion against God. The next expression here is, is that he says that we lie. Notice he said we lie and do not the truth. In other words, we refuse to practice truth and righteousness. We lie. Have you ever really thought about that? 
Again, chapter 2 and verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We find that in Revelation 21, verses 8 and verse 27, all liars shall be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 15, all liars will end up in hell. Now think about this. What is a lie? Why do people lie? Because they're filled with darkness. All men are liars before they get saved. In other words, the profession is to be tested by our daily life. Some people are saying they love God, but their lives say otherwise. Do you know anybody like this? I know many like this. In other words, it's a contradiction. They're, they're deceiving themselves according to verse 8 and 9. God told Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30 through about verse 34. He says unto him, he said, though they're going to come and listen to you, but he says, they will hear the words, but they do them not. He said, they'll hear the words, might even say a few good things about you, but they'll hear the words, but they'll do them not. In other words, they rebel against being obedient to the truths of God's Word. Let's read verse 6 again before that we turn away from this. He says here in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You can't have it both ways. We see today... We see today where that there's many churches that are embracing both sides of this. And, and the bottom line is, you can't do that. You can't do that. I want you to come with me to chapter 2 toward the end of the chapter. And notice as we read from verse 26 through verse 29. And let's just carry this a little bit farther before we go back and get into our third point. Notice as we come to this passage, he's speaking to believers. This whole book is speaking to believers. And he said this in verse uh, 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. Notice something abides in the believer. It's called the anointing. And it's called an unction from on high or from the Holy One in verse 20. It is the Holy Ghost that dwells within our bosom. He goes on to say, And you need not that any man teach you, but at the same, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, even it has taught you, you shall abide in Him. Notice in verse 28 and 29. So the Christian has an anointing. They have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. Verse 28, And now little children abide in Him, that when He shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. In verse 29, If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. Now I want you to think about this. Christians have the anointing. There's a clear distinction between them and the lost. And verse 29, we find here, there is proof that we belong to God. It's not just a testimony by word, but it is our life. Let's read this again. Verse 29. And if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. In other words, there is evidence of salvation. There is evidence, in other words, they have birthmarks. There is evidence, there is, they're practicing righteousness. In other words, they're walking in the light. They're walking toward heaven. That's what he's saying. Now let's carry this on a little bit farther. Notice as we come into chapter 3. Coming into chapter 3, 
I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doeth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now notice verse 3. And everyone that hath this hope, that is, everyone that has this anointing inside, that has the Holy Ghost dwelling inside, he said, and everyone that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is going to be the desire of those who have salvation. Notice in verse 4, Whoso committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoso abideth in him, that is, saved, joined to him, have fellowship with him. He said, Whoso abideth in him sinneth not, and whoso sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now this flips some people upside down. And it's caused some people to come and and try to approach this with a different kind of interpretation than what it just says. We've already read in chapter 2 and verse 29 that those who are saved, they do righteousness. They practice righteousness. They desire to walk in righteousness. And our text here is saying in verse 6 of chapter 3, Whoso abideth in him sinneth not, whoso sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. What is he saying? Well, what we're going to find here as we read on a few more verses, we're going to find the marks of a true believer. What he's saying is that those who have been born again, they have a desire to practice righteousness. Now think about this. It doesn't say you never make a mistake, but it says you do not live in habitual sin. That's what it's saying in the passage. Notice verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, here's that word again, he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. In other words, his heart and desire is not to chase after the things of this world. And then he says in verse 8, And he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What does he mean when he that committeth sin? That is, he that practices sin, he that lives in continual sin day in and day out. He's saying that he is of the devil. Now, I want you to notice the contrast that we're going to see here between the saved and the lost, between the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm going to be reading now from verses 9 uh, through about verse 12. Now, notice carefully as we read this. And by the way, just believe what it says. Because in verse 8, he talks about committing sin that is habitually practicing and willfully living in sin. In verse 9, he talks about those who do not commit sin. In other words, they don't live a habitual life in sin. And then he's going to show in verse 10 the contrast between the two groups of people that live in the world. Now, verse 9. Whoso is born of God doeth not commit sin. What does that mean? That means they don't live willfully in sin. They don't live habitually in sin. Their life is not dominated by sin. Because they are born again, they have the Holy Spirit in them. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The child of God cannot live in continued sin, cannot live in habitual, willful sin, because God will deal with him. Somebody say amen. Amen. 
This, I mean, if you just read the verses and let the verses say what they want to say, I've got commentaries on my shelf. They do a lot of gymnastics with this passage and saying, well, that just don't seem to fit other verses we got in the Bible. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It fits all of the verses. Bible says in James 2, faith without works is dead. We know that we're initially saved by the grace of God without works, but the fruit and the works follow those who have been born again and have the Spirit of God and the Word of God living in them. So the, so the, so the verse is not contradicting anything else that we read in, in the New Testament. So now notice with me in verse uh, 10. In this, in this what? The fact that there are those who live in sin, walk in darkness, and there are those who don't live in sin all the time, and they're walking in light. He said, in this, the children of God are manifest, that is, made known. You see the evidence of the children of God. You see it put on display. It is revealed. It's made plain. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. So we can tell whether someone is walking in light or walking in darkness, not only by their conversation, but by the life that they live and the desires of their heart. Now think about that. And he goes on to say, And whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And he uses Cain and Abel as an example in verse 12. Now let's get to our original passage. Let's go back to chapter 1 and notice with me in verse 7. I've had a lot of people say, I just don't understand 1 John chapter 2. If you take the whole book together, it's showing the marks of the true believer so that you can know and I can know whether we're truly born again. We're not just saying we have fellowship with God. We're living that fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ and with one another. I think this is one of the most important books in the Bible. I've used it many times. People struggling in their uh, salvation or their hope or whatever. I said, take this book and read it and read it and read it. And I think you'll come to the conclusion as to what you need to do. So I've said all of that and spent 40 minutes. Not wasted 40 minutes, but talking about that God is light and what that means. And that the unbeliever walks in darkness. Now we come to the fact of the believers who walk in light. Notice now as we read verse 7. In verse 7. Let us never justify sin. We see that so much today. Well, we're all just sinners. Well, we are. And we're saved by the grace of God. But according to the Bible, those who have been born again are to have a different life, a different heart, different desires, and walking on a different path. I think that's plain to us throughout the Holy Scripture. And they are to be shining lights in this world, illuminating those that are lost. We should not be struggling with the same things of those who are walking in darkness. Now notice, as we read in verse 7. He said in verse 7, and this is why, that if there are struggles, get at the altar and stay there until we get these things right. I told somebody this just a few weeks ago. I said, you get before God and you get these things right. 
That's whether you're a Christian or not. And if you aren't a Christian, you still get with God and you get things right as to how you ought to walk and live and how to think and speak. Notice with me in verse 7. He says in verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the light is to live in the light of God's truth in obedience to His commandments that He has given to us. That's what it means to walk in light. And also, he says, we have fellowship. We have a friendship with God. We're partakers of His divine nature. We have communion with God. We have communion with one another. And he also says, and He cleanses us from all sins. Why? Verses 9 and 10, because we confess those sins when we do fail God, we confess them and get right. You know, it's the difference between David and Saul. We find a few sins in David's life. And when David had sinned, David was like Peter the night he denied the Lord. Peter fell upon his face, wept bitterly, repented of that, because you know what? He loved the Lord. David loved the Lord. And when David sinned, David fell upon his face before God and repented and confessed and got those things right. How do we know that David wrote about it? David wrote about it. Saul, you know what Saul did? When Saul sinned and God dealt with him, Saul justified his sin and he blamed others. He wanted to blame others. That was the difference in a believer and an unbeliever. Now, let's talk about this. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Familiar verses, but very important verses. I have a feeling as a pastor, if I need to go over these things on a regular basis, I need to give them to you. I read over these things often because I want to encourage myself in the Lord and I want to make sure that I stay true to the Lord. Now notice with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading verse 5 through 8. Now again, let's come back to this thing about light and darkness. Light is a symbol of the Father, the Son, the saints. Light is a symbol of the gospel, as we've already mentioned, 2 Corinthians 4. It's a symbol of the church in Revelation 1. It is a symbol of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. It's a symbol of holiness and truth and love and life and good works. Darkness. Darkness in the Bible is a symbol of Satan and sin and evil and death and judgment and rebellion and hell and the lake of fire. There's a vast difference between these. Now, notice here in this passage in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 5. I'm just kind of cutting into the text here, speaking of the second coming of Christ. Notice he says to the church, he says, ye are all the children of light. We have a sermon about four or five months ago titled Children of Light in this series. He said, and you're all the children of light and the children of the day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Verse 8. But let us, who are the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for in helmet the hope of salvation. What we see here in this passage, we who are born again, we are children of light. This is speaking of our eternal relationship in the family of God. We are children of light. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. In the book of Ephesians, and notice with me in chapter 5. John Newton said one time, in reference to his salvation, his conversion, 
He said, I am not what I ought to be, I am not what I want to be, I am not what I hope to be, but still, I am not what I once used to be, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. Notice with me as we come to Ephesians 5. John Newton knew that he needed to grow and mature, but he also knew that he wasn't the sinner walking in darkness as he as when he was lost. Now, in the book of Ephesians, reading first of all, verse 8, chapter 5 and verse 8, he says in this passage, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. You see, God is light. And in Him is no darkness, no sin, no rebellion, no evil, no wickedness. Now you and I are called children of light, and we're called upon to walk in this light. To walk in light of God's Spirit and His Word. In other words, to walk in righteousness and truth and holiness. That's how that God wants you and I to walk. Paul even prays in chapter 1 for this church that they would be illuminated, they would be enlightened, that they would grow more and more in His grace. What is the opposite here of walking in light? It's walking in darkness. Let's back up to verse, in the chapter, to back up to verse uh, 3. Notice with me as we back up to verse 3. He begins here in this passage, well, he's talking about, by the way, in verse 2, walking in love. But verse 3, but fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He goes on to speak about vain words and other things that would come out of our mouth and our heart. The opposite of walking in light is to walk in darkness, and many things are covered in this chapter, but to walk in darkness is to walk with, in other words, not having the Word of God in our conversations. Notice in verse 4, he says, "...neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting," that is, laughter at this expanse of decency. He said, "...but the rather of giving of thanks." He said in verse 6, "...let no man deceive you with vain words." In other words... God wants our heart right. He wants our conversation right. And we need to be very careful, extremely careful about the words that come out of our mouth. We need to be talking about the right things. The kingdom of God. God's Word. His truth and His love. And instead of in the debates and arguments today that we hear in our country between what they call the left and the right and the Dems and Republicans, we need to be always speaking forth the truths of God's Word. There's several things that we see that line up of those who walk in darkness. We should always be speaking what God has given to us. But I want you to notice another thing mentioned here. And this is something I remind myself several times a year. Notice he says in verse 3, he mentions covetousness. And then he mentions it again in in verse 5. It's twice in this passage. And it's given to us again in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to about verse 15. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. How many believe that? He also mentioned it again in 1 Corinthians 5.11, a brother that is covetous, he says, have no fellowship with them. He mentions in Colossians chapter 3, a covetous person is an idolater. 
Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 says this, And he saith unto them, Take heed and beware of covetous, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. He mentions many times, Exodus 20 verse 17, one of the Ten Commandments, and 2 Timothy 3 1, it's a sign of the last, uh, you know, it's a, of the latter days. Covetousness. I've seen covetous people that would criticize the drug addict and the drunkard. And I love what Thomas Watson said. He said, covetousness is dry drunkenness. Those who are covetous are as guilty as the drunk and the drug addict and the harlot and anyone else. It's a horrible sin. I wrote an article on this in, in 2002, and I go back and read this every few months to remind myself of the importance of this. How do we define our worth in this world? Is it by the things which we possess? Or is it our walk with God? Think about this. We talk about the kids are overwhelmed with the toys today. Well, big boys and big girls have quite a few toys in this life. You see, we have, we kind of combine together Christianity and the American dream and they don't go together. God tells us having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And we find that, that covetousness destroys our lives. It is listed in the Bible among the worst of sins, Romans 129. It is equivalent to idolatry, Ephesians 5 verses 3 through 5. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, covetousness has damned many souls to hell. It is born out of hell, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It will be prevalent in the last days, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2. The sin of covetousness is forbidden by the 10th commandment. And today, our country is eat up with it. It has become a status symbol for success. And God says success is following His Word and walking in the light. Again, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. Covetousness is the cause of all sin. 1 John 2, verse 15 and 16. In Genesis chapter 3, it brought about the fall of man when Eve coveted the wisdom of the world. In Joshua 7.21, Achan coveted the accursed thing. David committed adultery when he coveted another man's life. Elisha's servant in 2 Samuel 11 became a leper after cutting, coveting money and clothes. And we find that uh, um, that would be David there. Elisha would be 2 Kings 5. Judas's carrot coveted money and committed suicide. The prodigal son coveted pleasure and was brought to ruin. Ahab coveted another man's land and was later judged. Lot's wife coveted city life and was judged by God. And Balaam coveted money and lost his own life. It destroys us. It destroys us. And, and again, Christianity is not the American dream. God wants us to follow Him and His Word and serve Him in His kingdom. This is what God says. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, God says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And the context of 1 Timothy 6 shows that riches cause blindness in verse 5 through 8. It causes bondage in verses 9 through 12. It causes boasting in verse 17 through 18. This is why in Matthew 13, 22, the Lord refers to the deceitfulness of riches. It gets our eyes off of the Lord. It destroys us. In verse 8 again, For we were sometimes darkness... But now are you light in the Lord, and he says, and walk as children of light. Notice in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, notice here. I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless. Notice the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run or in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul wanted them to walk in light and to shine forth the light into the world. His converts, those that sat under his ministry, he wanted to be able to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and see them receive rewards. Notice with me in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading in this passage, notice in Colossians 1, verses 12 and verse 13. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Notice who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Notice we're referred to as the saints of light in verse 12, and we've been delivered in verse 13 from the power of darkness. There's no excuse to walk in darkness as a Christian. 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter, notice with me in chapter 2. I've done mention to you twice, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 7. The gospel is compared to the light of creation. And I can testify to you this morning that it illuminated my 19-year-old soul in 1972, which has been past now 49 years. It made a change in my life. Amen. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of Him who had called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. There's a difference between darkness and life, righteousness and unrighteousness. Turn with me please to Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, Another passage I will give to you, the Apostle Paul in Acts 26, while he is preaching and talking about his ministry and what God would have him to preach. He said in verse 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This darkness in life is from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's very, very clear. Now notice with me in Romans chapter 13. I'm going to be reading from verse 11 through verse 14. Here's another quote by another author. And it's based upon 2 Samuel 13 verse 18. And I want you to listen to this, how true this is. As David's daughters were known by their garments of various colors, so are God's children by their piety and charity. And Avery, that was a part of your prayer this morning. God's children, who are children alike, are to walk in light, and they're known for this light that radiates from them. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of the sleep. For now is our salvation newer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Now watch this. And put, let us put on the armor of light. Wearing the armor of light. Verse 13. 
Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, drunkenness, nor chambering, or wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, now look at this, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. How do we overlook these verses? I talk to Christians every week that they profess to know Christ. How do they overlook these passages? He's telling us how to live. He's telling us how to walk. He's telling us how to conduct ourselves, even with our finances and things and whatever. He's telling us all of this, and for some reason we just keep looking over it and over it, and just like it doesn't exist. How do people sit down and do daily devotions and not find these verses? Turn with me to Matthew 5. We'll close here. Matthew chapter 5. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And he just said in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, there were those that sat in darkness that saw great light. This is great light. Now notice, in Matthew chapter 5, He speaks that we're salt in verse 13. It's not our subject right now, but in verse 14 through 16, we're going to close here about the fact that we're to be the light of the world. Notice as we come to verse 14. You see, the Lord Jesus begins His sermon here in in Matthew 5. Speaking, beginning in verse 3, the poor in spirit... And then those that mourn and those that are meek. Those that hunger and thirst in verse 6. Those that are merciful. Verse 7. Those that are pure in heart. Verse 8. And those that are peacemakers in verse 9. And then those that are going through persecution. Verse 10, 11, 12. How that they are to conduct themselves. But notice our text. I want you to see that believers... Are to, uh, are to illuminate a dark world. Not join the world. Not have the conversations that the world has. We are to keep God's commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. If they're grievous to us, maybe we need to get saved. He said, my commandments are not grievous in 1 John chapter 5. They're delightful because they're good for us. Notice verse 14. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. An amazing passage. Another parallel passage mentions putting it under a bed. The bushel probably represents commercialism. The bed probably would represent laziness in Luke 8 and verse 16. In other words, our light will not be shining if we're caught up in all the commercialism and things of this world or if we're lazy when it comes to the kingdom of God. Our lights are to shine. They're to shine in a dark world. Christians are to walk in light because light dwelleth in them and their God is light. The Word is light. The Holy Spirit is light. Everything about the Christian life is light. And everything about the lost world is darkness. All they can talk about is the things of this world. How much money they have, how many things they own, politics, sports, the educational system, war, things of that nature, that is their conversation. You think about it. Just sit down and listen 
The people talk and you will know where they're coming from. Whether the Spirit of God dwells in them, whether they have a desire for the things of God, you will know exactly who they are. Whether they're a child of light or a child of darkness. Children of light embrace God's truth. They want God. They desire God more than anything else in this world. Now this is biblical truth. You ought to go back and just read also what some of the early church writers spoke about this subject. I'm not saying they're infallible, but just some of the subjects that they covered is absolutely amazing. Would you stand with me this morning? Church, I pray that we will grow more and more in His grace. We will love Him more. We will talk about Him more. We will desire Him more. That we will truly be a shining light as individuals and as a church. That this place will glow for the glory of God. We will not be caught up in the politics of the day. We will not be caught up in the sports of the day. We will not be caught up in chasing our teams and things of that nature. We will not be caught up in covetousness of the day. But we will be caught up in the things of God. Father, we thank You this morning. We love You. We praise You, dear God. You've given us Your Word. Lord, You've not given us a book of suggestions. You've given us a book of truth and love and commandments and precepts that You would have us to follow. Lord, help us to follow them. Help us to believe them. Help us to love You. Lord, help us to walk in the light that our light may shine, that men would see our good works and they would glorify You. They would praise You. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.